Well, hey, I'm Greg. Welcome back to my little shop here. I spent the past week uh, cleaning my solar panels, uh, including removing all the leaves and debris from underneath them, and then installing some uh, wire mesh critter guard around the perimeters. Quite a lot of work out in the hot sun. Uh, my issue really wasn't uh, with birds or squirrels nesting underneath them, but um, that was always a possibility. My real concern was that leaves and needles, like a lot of trees in the backyard, were collecting underneath them. Um, I didn't film it because there's at least 101 videos on YouTube already that show that process. But anyway, I'm glad to get it done. Now I really need to get a video uh, uploaded to YouTube so you don't forget about me. It's been uh, too long again. I really need to build a bigger subscriber base and this doesn't help when I spend so long between videos. I was honestly well into a project and was filming it uh, of making a jig for sharpening the tips and edges of my end mills. And then uh, I found on Sunday that uh, Quinn over at Blondie Hacks has beat me to the punch. Um, she started working on a, on a project doing exactly the same thing from a kit. So I'm going to let her uh, progress along on that a little bit to um, see if I want to make some changes in mine, let her discover the problems. Uh, anyway, here's, here's my basic setup here. Rather than starting from scratch with bare metal, I figured I'd uh, use some off-the-shelf parts. Like I've got this little uh, table here that uh, you know, lifts up and down. that will give me my height adjustment. I've got some magnets that'll hold it to a metal base that'll, that'll give my, my course back and forth. I bought this mini milling table, but it's too big and heavy. I need to um, either find a smaller one or make my own. It really only needs one plane of adjustability. And then finally I bought this ER32 um, collet holder that'll hold my end mills, whatever size I need to put in there. And this is shaft is long enough to provide my, uh, well I guess this is the way it'll go, um, back and forth into the, uh, the CBD wheel for, for grinding the edges. So anyway, that's the plan. And as I say, I'm going uh, to let Quinn progress with that and see, uh, see how she makes out. And then I will get back to that on my next project. So for today's video, um, I really need to find something else quick and dirty that I could just get something published. So, oh, probably close to a year ago, um, I made a little shaky cam video showing how I'd made an X and Y power feed on my mill um, just using simple uh, car wiper motors, 12 volt wiper motors and, and some PW1 controllers. So in that video about a year ago, uh, it's turned out to be my most watched video on this channel. Uh, I guess no, to no great surprise, everybody wants power feeds. Uh, so in that video, I showed the mechanics of how I'd created the, uh, the X and Y power feeds, but I really punted on the electrics. I said I was going to get back to it sometime later, and I never did. So I think in this video here, I will finally get around to doing that. Also in that video, so I'm going to tear apart um, one of the PW1 controllers to show you the guts inside it, and I'll also publish a, a simple electrical diagram in the description below, and, um, and a parts list. And I also showed in that earlier video that I had isolated the grounds on one of my um, motors. Uh, that was necessary because the uh, plus and negative can, can be swapped back and forth, but one side is ground. So if you've got two motors that are both sharing the same common ground and you try to make one plus and one negative, sparks will fly, right? So I isolated one of the motors. I'm going to isolate the other motor to show you how it's done. And also, I, in that previous video, I showed how I wired the motors, or at least I told how I wired the motors so that I could get more speed out of them. And I'll do that with my uh, Y motor this time. I left it alone originally at original speed. Now I'm going to uh, do the increased speed too because I'd, I'd rather have some little more speed on my vertical lift as well. So anyway, I know and then finally there may be just a little bit of machining at the very end of this video because how I mounted my Y motor onto the shaft, just screwed it on with a, with a coupler around it. Um, I want to remake that coupler just so it, uh, it's easier to gain, a gain access to that, uh, to that fitting in future. So with that long introduction uh, said, uh, let's get on with it. Here we go. Well, since it's been about a year since that original video on these uh, power feeds, let me just do a real quick recap. This is my Precision Matthews PM30MV benchtop mill. And very soon after I got it, I found I wasn't able to crank this uh, crank because I got very bad right shoulder rotator cuff injury. So very shortly after I bought the mill, I jerry-rigged this uh, 
little Z-axis uh, power feed and it works so well with this uh, simple car wiper motor and PW1 controller that then I did the more elaborate job here still with the same Jeep power uh, Jeep wiper motor and same PWM controller but a little more mechanical involvement here and I detail all this mechanical stuff in my earlier video as you can see it's a belt drive setup here so I can keep my original crank handles um, for for manual use this is the clutch to disengage hard to do with one hand there but now I can use my uh, my crank as normal on each side so I did all the mechanical stuff earlier and now uh, this video is really focused on the electrical. So my plan here is to take one of these PWM controller boxes apart to show you the wiring. I've got the uh, connectors in the back here for a quick disconnect. So I'll probably take this bottom, the X one apart, the easiest one to get off, show you what's inside. Uh, I already did detail the inside of the limit switches, but I'm going to show the wiring to them. So this is just limits the x-axis travel and I've also got limit switches for my z-axis up and down here. These limit switches touch my uh, DRO scale bracket there, top and bottom. So that was just a real quick recap of what I've got here. So now let me get to uh, taking one of these PW1 controllers apart and show you what's inside. So I want to show you what a PWM controller looks like out of the box as I should order it. Now in honesty this was one that I had on the uh, x-axis originally and I zapped it by not having that isolated ground. So I killed it. I was able to actually find out, I'm an electronics guy, so I was able to find out what was gone wrong in there and fixed it. But meanwhile I'd ordered another one uh, so this is now just a spare. But I reconstructed basically how it came out of the box. Um, the LED is already wired up. I put an R on there so after I disconnected these wires uh, I wouldn't forget which goes where. There's a six contactor and a five contactor so you can't get them wrong once you disconnect it but you have to mark where the R is. You're going to these off. R for red of course. Uh, it comes with the potentiometer. This has an on off switch built in as well as the pot itself. Um, and and I, I just leave it wired just the way it is. No need to touch that at all. And then here's the direction switch, forward and reverse basically, or left and right for the x-axis, or up and down for the z-axis. And of course you can orient this in the cabinet, in your, in your box, any way you want that makes sense. Um, now I have put these wires back on here as they came from the factory, just to show you how they come. And then what I do, uh, so the yellow wire can stay in place, it's the common wire, that then choose the direction to these signal wires, either red or black, for left and right. And for these guys, I cut them off and unsoldered them. Now this is a cheap ass switch, you might want to get a better switch, but I'm using this one that came and it works just perfectly fine so far. If it ever, if it ever goes bad, I'll just get a better quality one. Uh, but anyway, I cut the wire off, left the yellow one in place, and then, well, I'll show you on, on the other unit in a minute, but then I basically, make this in series with those limit switches, right? So it goes out through the limit switch and then back in through the red wire or the black wire. Out through the limit switch and then back in through the red wire or black wire and I'll show you that in a second. So basically the limit switch is in series with here so that when the limit switch, which is normally closed, if it opens up, then it cuts the power just as if you turned the switch off into the neutral position, okay? So that's how that works. And the other, only other thing I did, um, I wanted all my wires coming out 
this side. Um, well, I wanted these wires coming out this side, so kind of short. And so what I did was I just um, removed these two screws from the case and took off the case. Very simple to remove. It's just it's just two screws that remove the. Um, case. Now obviously you might want to, might not need to do this in your situation so that I could put these, um, sorry this is the one I wanted out this side. This one stays out here. The potentiometer is the one I wanted out this side, out the front of the box. So this is where the, uh, where the panel is going to go and then these wires here are going to hook up to the, uh, the power and the motor out the back. Okay so that's what I did. I just, I just wrote those guys out there uh, put the case lid back on. I won't bother boring you with putting in the screws again, but it basically this this PCB board slips into two little slots there so it can't go so it doesn't go up and down, keeps it isolated from the frame. And then this casing um, slots in to those little tabs there. It takes a little finicky at first, but I it's not that big a deal. And then you put the two screws in to hold it in place. Okay, so that's the only mod I made to my PW1 controller. And then I can show you it over here, the one that I just took off the mill. This was my uh, x-axis to show you how I put all those components in there. So again, the potentiometer just stays wired the way it was. The only thing I did was rooted out the other end of the box. Um, so it's got the on-off switch and the speed controller already built in. You don't need to do anything with it. Here's the left and right switch or up and down or whatever you call it, um, with the yellow neutral wire. And the only reason this is cut is I had to replace this thing, uh, but I wouldn't normally have had that cut that. That's this yellow wire connected to the center as always. And then the red and the black wires are the ones that I have running through the connector, sorry, the connector over here, which then goes out to my limit switches uh, for left and right in this case, those limit switches on the front of the mill or up and down in the case of the other one and then back again, right? So all that does is, is route the power out to the limit switch. I'll, I'll put the wiring diagram in the, in the uh, comments below and back again, uh, which will kill the power if the limit switch opens up, okay? The uh, LED, or LCD rather, no LED is right, seven di di eight digit display here. Um, I just made this very simple, just hacked this out with a hacksaw. I, don't even, I didn't even use a mill to do this, I don't think. Um, piece of aluminum because as they come they have no they have no way to fasten them. So basically I just made a very tight fitting piece of aluminum to squeeze the sides then I crazy glued it in place and then it has two screws through drilled and tapped screw holes there that I can then uh, you know screw it into the panel to hold it in place. So that holds it from the front and this holds it from the back and all's good. Um, and then the only other thing here is this additional switch, this uh, push button momentary contact switch. And all it does is on the potentiometer for the speed, um, you figure out which one is the maximum speed setting here. In my case, it's, you know, fully clockwise is maximum speed. And that, and all this switch does is short out the center, which is the wiper for the potentiometer. I don't know if you can see it in my, there or not. It shorts out the wiper to the, to the fastest speed. So it's just like the pot wasn't in there or the pot was turned to full speed. So, so if you have the pot turned to you know, something low or midway or something and you push that button, it's just like you turned the pot all the way up. So that's just uh, basically shorts out the pot for full speed. So nothing else to show in the back there. Of course, the other, the other connector here is for my power. I've got my uh, power leads coming in to my power supply from my power, you know, from my power supply down there. The power leads coming into my PWM controller, where it's marked power, of course, plus and minus, and then the plus and minus out to the motor. And this plus and minus actually reverse minus and plus according to this switch to turn the motor in the other direction. And then these. Uh, Connectors I, I've linked below as well. They're just four pin connectors uh, that have nice secure screw on connectors there so they uh, so they stay in place. And of course, then I've got connectors on the wires that go out to the uh, power supply and the motor and the uh, in series limit switches. All right, so the wire diagram below, I think you'll be able to figure that out. I really like this box. 
nice and sturdy. Again, it's linked below. Um, but it's a very tight fit, as you can see. You have to, you have to, you know, you don't have a whole lot of room to mess with here. Oh, it goes that way. Um, so be careful where you put your PWM in the box to give yourself enough room to clear all these components. Oh, and I mounted the PWM. It comes, if you look at, at the one out of the box here, it has three little M3 tapped holes here in a triangle shape. And so that's it. Actually, got a couple more there too. But I use these three center ones to screw it to the back of the uh, box. Okay. And then what holds the box together? It's very clever, actually. These the, uh, it has nice little um, what do you call that rails here that these guys fit into nicely, so they can't go back and forth this way. And then what holds it this way is the uh, front and back covers themselves. They screw in and and hold it from from going. But I first have to put this on the mill because the way I mount it to the mill is with uh, these three screws as you saw me take them out. So I put the, those three screws on the mill first then I assemble it all basically in place. Oh, by the way, I dropped one of the screws as I took it out. I knew I was going to, but luckily, it's really nice. This, uh, when you buy this box from Amazon, it came with about four additional screws um, in the package and I happened to save them. So there we go, I got, a little, I got extra screws. So that was lucky. All right, so let me put it back on the mill, put it back together, and uh, get on to the next step. That's it for now. Because my original Z-axis motor already had a wire cut on it, I'm going to go with a brand new one here that I've got. I bought this one as a spare a long time ago as I bought the others. They're so cheap, it's good to have a spare around. So I'm going to use this as my new Z-axis motor and I can show you what I did to it right from scratch. So first of all, I don't want this plug at all. I'm just going to cut this guy off and wire it in directly. Oh, and where I said uh, black ground before, actually, I see now it's, it's, it's truly brown wire, not black. But it is still the uh, negative or ground wire. And that is wired directly to the chassis. Actually, you can see it there attached to the chassis. And it, but it's not just as, as simple as removing that screw to prevent the ground feedback loop. But uh, I'm going to disconnect it internally as well. So let me just show you the different speeds we can get out of this thing. The green is normally the 50% speed, slow speed wiper. The red is the 100% speed, high speed wiper. Of course, these colors will change depending on the model of wiper motor you get, but I think this is fairly standard. Somewhat standard, anyway. So I've got a lab power supply here. I've got it set to 12 volts right now. So let me go uh, negative and positive on the low speed first. Hold this down because it's got quite a lot of torque to it. So there's the low speed wiper. I think you can see that turning. And there's the high speed wiper. And then what I found experimentally was that gives me one and a half speed. Okay? That uses both windings of the motor additively. And uh, of course I can go forward and reverse with it. So this is what I'm going to do with my Z-axis as I hook it back up. I've already got this this way on the uh, uh, X-axis 
using the red and the green and I've disconnected the uh, the chassis ground but I don't think it's enough just to disconnect it here because um, these the, the windings of the motor have a center tap and the center tap is connected to ground here as well that's how this is connected to the center tap of the motor so I do have to disconnect it from the uh, from the motor itself as I did on the other one so I'm just going to remove this case it's just two uh, screws to take out uh, it's a pretty powerful magnet in here so it takes some force to get this off but it comes that looks like it's nicely lubed already. So there's the motor. And so here, the green one is connected through this choke to this connection here, which goes to this brush. The commutator there. And then the red one is connected through this choke to this brush. So those are the two that I want. And then the ground, this here, this screw here, this is soldered here to that screw and that forms a ground connection which is connected to this brown wire. So that's the center tap one and that's the one I need to disconnect. And so the simple way to disconnect it is just to cut it off here at the base. I'm going to cut it off down here so I can reconnect it if I want to but I'm not going to want to. And then just get it out of the way. I'm not sure if you saw that or not. Let's keep you in focus in frame. I just snipped off this brush from that ground connection. I can remove this ground here too. It's sort of uh, overkill. I don't need to because it's disconnected internally. But this will make it absolutely clear that that brown wire goes nowhere now. So why don't I do that? Just disconnect that brown wire entirely from the chassis ground. Put the case back on. Now again, these magnets are a little difficult to overcome. And put my screws back in. All right, now I'll give it a test. So now we only have the red and the green available for super speed. And they should still give us super speed, of course. Hold that down. Excuse me. Well, shit. Seems like we be trying to connect, trying to make it go. I'm guessing it's a mechanical issue in here. I've frozen my shaft somehow. Let's see, is there a right way or wrong way to put this on? Looks symmetrical to me. Let me try flipping this around. That spins. That's on. On, disconnected, red and green. And it's working. So that's it. The case is not symmetrical. It, it does have a little indent on it on one side. And it matters. Cool. So the motor was trying to turn, but the case was preventing it. Anyway, there's our super speed. And um, it, it, it can always speed, you can also speed it up with uh, extra voltage. I've got my uh, voltage supply set to 16 volts. And with a pulse wood modulator, that's just fine. The motor doesn't get hot at 16. A little extra power, give it a little extra speed. I wouldn't go any higher than 16 or 18 now, but there's, there's 16 right there. Okay, I think we're good. Meanwhile, I'm going to um, get rid of these excess wires here that we don't need. 
I'll just uh, zip tie them back here. Or I can put them right inside this sleeve. Get them out of the way. By the way, the extra, the blue and the yellow there are on a wiper motor. They, it, it senses the, uh, the two positions. And so we're, it automatically it's used by the controller, the motor controller on a windshield wiper to, to reverse direction. But obviously I don't need it in this uh, application. Just the red and the green. Back over to the uh, mill. I just want to take a minute to show some detail of how the Z-axis wiper motor attaches to the mill. In the original video, I disassembled the X-axis components to show them all in detail, but I didn't disassemble the Z-axis parts. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but uh, while I had it apart, I just snapped some pictures to show you how it all comes together. You can, of course, pause the video to see more detail if needed. Basically, there are four parts involved. Uh, starting from the motor side, there's a simple aluminum faceplate shown here attached to the motor. The motor faceplate, in turn, attaches to another mill faceplate shown here. And the mill faceplate attaches to a hollowed-out aluminum block and that block then attaches to the face of the mill surrounding the original z-axis crankshaft area. Uh, the fourth part, not shown here but you'll see it soon, is a simple threaded sleeve that connects the threads on the crankshaft to the threads on the motor. Uh, by coincidence and pure good fortune, they happen to be the same thread, which is a quarter twenty if I recall correctly. Okay, I've got the motor wired back up again at its increased speed. I'm about to put it back on here, but before I do, I want to arrange a better way to um, fasten it, to secure it into this threaded connection. So this threaded connection is a piece I made on the uh, lathe earlier. I've got it attached to the shaft here, where the crank used to be, and it's very securely attached with retention compound. To get it off, I'd have to heat it up and use a wrench on that. I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to work this in place. So here's the motor, and it just screws into that part. What I just do is I just turn the motor on, and I just screw it in as I'm putting it together. And as you can see, it'll go in that far. And what I want to do is uh, screw it in, and then drill right through this uh, threaded sleeve and into the uh, shaft of the motor right through it, and then put a, a, a set screw all the way through. And that'll be really good. I won't need to use any um, thread locker in there at all. It'll be held in by the screw going through the two pieces. And that way I'll be able to take the screw out to uh, take it off easily in future, rather than having to wrestle with that uh, thread locker. Now the only um, consideration there though is, and I've been to do this anyway, is here is the piece that covers over that threaded sleeve and obviously I'm going to need to have a way to get at that set screw to remove it and tighten it so I'm going to cut a, a little window in the side of this mill a window in the side of this block here to uh, be able to have access to that screw of course I can turn the screw into, into position using my motor uh, in order to get at it and then I'll put a little cover on that as well to keep the uh, chips out. Okay, the motor is reconnected. I'm going to use the uh, power feed to screw it in, which is that way. Very slowly until it seats. No retention compound on here this time. No uh, thread locker, I mean. So we'll just get it screwed up till it comfortably seats. That's it. I've got the uh, column locked here so it wouldn't turn. And now I can uh, drill through both pieces in place for uh, an M5 set screw. I enlarged the holes through the motor shaft to remove the internal threads again. 
Now I need to open up the blocks inside hole a little to provide clearance for the M4 cap screw head. I also need to mill the little slot to provide a window for installing the M4 cap screw later. I thinned the cap screw head so it'll have clearance inside the enlarged block hole and shortened it a little so it goes all the way through to both sides of the coupler but not much further, again for proper clearance. So then on to machining those simple changes to the block. I used a boring bar to open up the diameter to a depth to a half an inch which is plenty far enough for the location of the cap screw and then milled a corresponding window through the side for access to the cap screw. And here's what it looks like now. Oh, I also made this simple aluminum cover for the side of the block to cover the window. Now let's get it back together. I used blue thread locker for the reassembly, first joining the block to its face plate. Then the block and face plate are reattached to the mill with three long M5 screws. Now these are existing threaded holes in the mill column. I found that my Z-axis control box is getting in the way of accessing the window for the cap screw. The control box is attached to the mill's motor cover, so removing that cover killed two birds with one stone, giving me lots of access to the window. Then I screwed the motor back into the coupler using the power feed. No thread locker here. Then turned further until the uh, hole lined up in the window. Now the M4 cap screw is installed through the window easily enough. Again, this screw goes all the way through both sides of the coupler, so it makes a very secure connection. And I gave it a quick test to make sure it was working properly before then uh, reattaching the motor face plate to the mill face plate with those three M5 screws. My hands are in the way of the camera here for much of this, so it won't make you watch it all. And in the morning, I remembered to install that little cover on top of the window. I also did some cable management, make sure everything's all clean and neat and the links are all correct. As I wrap this up, I realized there's one little thing I wanted to mention, a little detail, that those boxes, the way they're mounted on the bottom and the top, still allow that the uh, mill motor cover can be removed, and that's important, of course. Now, to finally wrap this up, uh, here's a little demo of the Z and X-axis power feeds in use and even in the use at the same time towards the end here. And that's when it's critical that you isolate the grounds of at least one of the motors. Really happy with the increased speed of the Z-axis lift, although I doubt I'll use it all that often at this high speed. Of course, the speed can be easily controlled uh, to whatever you want under that maximum. And once again, I tested that the cables were uh, proper length and behaved themselves well in all positions of the ups and downs and lefts and rights. All looks good. And I also uh, made sure that the limit switches were working correctly, left and right and up and down. I really hope this video has been useful to at least one of you out there, if you're following along. And to everyone who made it this far, a sincere thanks for watching, and hope to see you again soon.